Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online.
Hello, I'm and good morning. I'm Steve Morrison, Senior Vice President here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And we're delighted this morning to be joined by Senator Chris Van Hollen, Democrat of Maryland. Chris, thank you so thank much for being with us. It's great to be with you, Dr. Morrison. Senator Van Hollen was elected to the Senate in November of 2016 and serves on the Banking and Appropriations Committees prior to that served a number of terms 2002 to 2016 in the House of Representatives, representing Maryland's eighth district, where he served in the Democratic Party leadership and the budget committee with a special focus on social security and Medicare. Um, he served prior to that in the Maryland state legislature. He's a graduate of Swarthmore, the JFK School of Public Policy at Harvard and the Georgetown Law Center. Uh, welcome. And thank you. This is a very solemn day. Uh, we've crossed the threshold yesterday at which 100,000 individuals here in America uh, have, have died in less than three months of COVID-19. Uh, we should use this moment today, I believe, at the outset to honor and mourn their passing. It's an unimaginable loss. Uh, Senator Van Hollen, if you want to say a few words. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Morrison. As you say, it's a, a solemn moment. Uh, we've lost uh, over 100,000 of our fellow Americans in a very short period of time. Uh, this pandemic is also wreaking havoc in other places around the world, which means that uh, we need to do everything we can uh, to make sure that we continue to slow its spread and that we address uh, the economic pain that has also resulted uh, from this virus. But first and foremost, uh, to the families um, who have lost loved ones, um, we are with you, as we're with uh, those on the front lines, uh, the healthcare providers, the nurses, the doctors, and others who have put themselves at risk uh, to help others, and in many cases uh, have themselves uh, lost their lives. So. Uh, this is a moment uh, to reflect, but also to rededicate ourselves uh, to defeating this virus. Thank you so much. Our purpose today is to discuss with, with Senator Van Hollen the state of the response and the, and the way forward. Uh, here in the United States, uh, our focus is going to be really domestic, and it's going to be twofold. It's a focus on the economic dimensions of the response, as well as the public health measures that have been instituted. We'll, we'll have a conversation here for the next 30 minutes and then we'll open up uh, to questions that have come from our audience members uh, that we will call and, and come forward and then we'll close promptly uh, at, at uh, 945. So let's kick things off. Um, Senator, uh, March 26th, Congress passed and the president signed into law the CARES Act, the largest economic relief package in history, 2.2 trillion. Uh, that followed the earlier tax relief bill uh, a month later, the emergency interim bill, almost uh, half a trillion dollars was added on to that. As you look at the big picture today on, on the intentions, the intentions behind these bills, they have many different dimensions and many different targets, businesses, individuals, uh, parts of our government, state, local, public health, there's many different dimensions. Have these measures in your view had the stabilizing in, in, uh, impact that we intended for them? Well, the short answer is I think there have been mixed uh, results. Uh, certainly, uh, we are better off today because uh, Congress on a partisan basis uh, passed those enormous emergency relief uh, packages. Uh, but that doesn't mean that millions of Americans are not hurting. Uh, and as you know, all those pieces of legislation contain uh, elements focused on the healthcare battle to defeat the virus and treat those who have COVID-19. And then, of course, the other focus, uh, what we're talking about right now, uh, which is to really help weather the economic storm. Uh, and if you look at the monies that have gone out the door, as you say, they fall into several categories. Uh, one is relief aimed at individuals. And probably the biggest and most important piece of that uh, is the unemployment uh, insurance uh, changes we made. Uh, the additional $600 a week, uh, also making sure that unemployment compensation was eligible to a much broader group of people uh, than is normally uh, the case. 
Uh, that is going to be a critical lifeline. Now, that said, there have been very serious implementation problems. If you just look at uh, my state of Maryland, uh, we're getting calls uh, hundreds per day from people who have not been able to access uh, those funds. And so that's creating a critical cash flow uh, problem for them. It means that other forms of assistance like food assistance are even more important. And we see uh, longer lines uh, partly because of the backup on UI. Uh, there's also, of course, the individual payments that have gone out and many of those have been sent. Uh, many are still in the mail or have not been processed. And then there are also, as you indicated, the programs like the Paycheck Protection Program uh, that were designed to help small businesses and nonprofits keep more employees on their payrolls. Uh, there was a rocky rollout there. Uh, we have made important reforms. Uh, and I think, you know, again, there's a mixed results story, but, but all told, um, it is fair to say that without these uh, programs, uh, people would be in much more uh, desperate shape uh, than they are. The last point I'll make here, Steve, is we, we do see this big disconnect between Wall Street and Main Street. Uh, on one of the days where we reached record numbers of Americans who were unemployed, we actually saw the stock market uh, go way up. And uh, we do have over 35 million people out of work. Uh, we have an unemployment rate today around 20%. Uh, so uh, the, the economy, of course, uh, is taking a big hit. And the big question will be, um, are we able to weather the storm? And then what kind of recovery uh, will we see? So let's talk a bit about the politics of getting these measures through. We've had these four measures through. It's an extraordinary scale of investment. One economist, I think it was Paul Krugman last week, estimated that when you look at these bills, it's covering 70 to 80% of the wage bill of Americans, which is truly extraordinary. Um, how did this happen in the politics of getting these measures through on a bipartisan basis? I mean, Congress, once it got into action, uh, it, there was some delays in getting into action, but once it got into action, Congress moved fairly expeditiously through these different measures. Um, what was it? What was it that made a bipartisan uh, level of consensus possible, in your view? What were the drivers? Well, you're right. I think everybody knows uh, that we're in a very politically polarized period of time um, over the last uh, many years, uh, and yet Congress was able to quickly uh, come together and pass uh, four pieces of the legislation uh, in relatively order. Uh, and I do think it's an indication that uh, of a recognition of the incredible national emergency that we were facing. We wanted to rush resources uh, to the front lines of the healthcare system, uh, nurses, doctors, also make sure we invest resources uh, in looking for a vaccine uh, as well as uh, for therapeutics. And then on the economic side, a recognition that uh, if you're going to stop the virus, you have to engage in social distancing. And if you have in social distancing, that means uh, the economy is going to slow down and you need to help people weather the storm. Uh, so while there were many differences of opinion and we did have a vigorous debate on these bills, um, in the end, we were able to uh, pull together. Uh, I will say that there were lots of uh, provisions in the final bills that we passed that were important to working people. Uh, and small businesses that were not part of the original proposals uh, from the Trump administration uh, or from Senator McConnell and Senate Republicans. Uh, but, you know, in the end, the, the process um, worked. It's not perfect, uh, but it's certainly um, an important response. What is your thinking on the, the debate that's unfolded recently around what are the unintended consequences if you're paying out a, a generous $600 per week uh, unemployment additional benefit. Does that deter people from going back to work in your view? I think people want to work. Uh, and, and uh, you know, you want to make sure you have the security of a job. The $600 uh, extra weekly payment uh, expires at the end of July. Uh, now, I do think that we should uh, continue that or certainly some other enhanced payment uh, going forward. But I want to make it clear that uh, if you have a job 
or if you got a job offer, um, you're not entitled uh, to uh, collect the additional $600 a week. Uh, now, I've joined with some of my Senate colleagues, uh, Senator Chris Murphy and Senator Jeff Merkley, uh, to propose something called the Rebuilding Main Street Act, which takes advantage of what's called the work share program. So if you're a small employer um, and you don't have enough customers coming in your door uh, today uh, to hire back all your employees, let's say you can only bring back 30% of them uh, at 30, or excuse me, bring them back at 30% pay. Uh, you could go on a work share program, and as part of that, uh, under our proposal, a small business could also get funds to help support their fixed, uh, some of their fixed costs up to $300,000. It's a much more flexible program than PPP. Um, we need to fix PPP uh, in the process. Uh, but uh, I do, and, and the last point I want to make there, uh, Steve, is that uh, if you adopt that program, every single worker is better off coming back to work. Uh, even though they continue to benefit from the additional $600 a week, they also get the benefit of at least a partial paycheck uh, from their uh, employer. So we think that's a way to bring people back to work in a way that helps the worker and the small businesses uh, uh, at the same time. Yes. Um, I found this work chair proposal that you put forward quite intriguing and, and an interesting sort of additional uh, new innovation that could be, it's, it's not entirely new, it would be expanding on something that we know works. Can you, uh, can you also say a bit about the calculations that people make, individuals make about going back to work? As things are reopening right now, it's not simply material considerations that come into play. There are considerations around personal protection and safety against the virus. There's issues around home care for children or others. What are you hearing from your constituents as they try? I think every I think you're absolutely right that everybody wants to get back to a life that gave them full meaning before, and it may be in a new normal, but they're having to make a complicated set of, uh, of decisions right now. Well, first uh, on the healthcare front, I mean, you're absolutely right. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, when people come back to work, uh, they're coming back to work in a safe environment, uh, which is why the bill that passed the House most recently that uh, we've been pushing Senator McConnell to take up and vote on in the Senate uh, contains a provision uh, directing uh, the federal government, directing OSHA to establish a set of health care standards, workforce safety uh, standards, uh, because that obviously is an important consideration. Uh, we don't want to require people to come back into unsafe circumstances. And child care is a very big uh, issue. Uh, you know, we've been having students, of course, not at school. Uh, and most schools of the country are not reopening this year. Uh, and of course, then we've got the summer coming and child care uh, is a top priority, affordable child care, safe child care uh, for families. And again, the HEROES Act, uh, which passed the House, has significant additional support uh, to provide to states uh, for affordable child care. And, you know, we talked about uh, how the earlier four bills, especially the CARES Act, uh, passed the United States the Congress in a bipartisan manner and were signed by the president. Uh, of course, we now have this big bill that's come out of the House that covers a lot of the issues you're asking about right now and addresses some of those problems, which is why we'd like to see Senator McConnell take it up. And if you don't want to pass it as is, I mean, we all have you know proposed changes. Um, let's debate them, but let's get it done. Yes. Well, we do seem to be at a critical turning point right now um, where we're trying to think more long term than we did a few months back. Um, and by that, I, I mean, you know, some of these key measures are going to be spent out or get, to, as you point out, they'll reach the end and they need to be extended and for what period. And that we're seeing this debate emerging. Um, Jerome Powell, head of Federal Reserve, I think pushed that debate forward in saying, look, we have to make a, a bigger and longer term uh, commitment and investment here in order to avoid deep damage to the US economy. That view, uh, of course, is, is something that gives great support to the notion around, around the HEROES Act. 
Others are arguing, wait a second, we need, there's so much money on the table and there's so much happening here. Let's pause for a bit and see where we are and see what is happening. And there's worry about, of course, too much deficit, too much spending. Tell us a bit about your own views on this. There was a very important banking committee meeting last week that you participated in, in which the administration, members of the Senate banking, debated these issues out. Tell us a little bit about where that stands, that debate. Well, that's right. We did have a, an important hearing in the banking committee. Um, it was a, an all virtual uh, hearing, which of course is uh, a new experience uh, for uh, the different Senate uh, committees. Uh, but as you say, uh, the chairman of the Federal Reserve uh, in his Sphinx-like manner, but, but nevertheless, um, I think set clear direction that he thought additional fiscal uh, action uh, was required, uh, pointing out that the Federal Reserve has important tools, but uh, they are limited. And as you indicated, a, a lot of the monies allocated by Congress in these bills take some time to spend out. Um, although those for individuals uh, have, of course, moved faster uh, than some of the others. And that means you've got to be sort of looking over the horizon. And if you look at the projections from the Federal Reserve, if you look at the projections from the Congressional Budget Office, uh, you'll see that, you know, towards the end of the year, while things may be better than they are now, we're going to still have very high levels of unemployment. And one of the things the chairman of the Federal Reserve has pointed out um, is the stickiness of unemployment. Um, we find that to the extent people have work for longer periods of time, it's harder for them to get back uh, into the workforce. So the more people we can keep on payroll, the more people we can have safely come back uh, to work, uh, the better. Uh, and we need all the, the tools to do that. So I'm of the camp uh, that we should act now. Um, and that's what the HEROES Act does. And I should point out uh, that one third of that is assistance to state and local governments. Um, what, what does that mean? I mean, these are the essential public services uh, that we all get um, in our counties and places where we where we live, uh, and they include everything from you know picking up the trash uh, to emergency services uh, to schools and, and making sure that teachers continue to get paid. And I can tell you uh, that Mitch McConnell's first prescription, which was just let them go bankrupt, uh, would have just made a bad situation much much worse. And so. Uh, that's one element of the HEROES Act. It does represent about a third of the bill. Sure, and I can tell you, speaking to my local officials, uh, they're talking about significant budget cuts. And that doesn't help anybody. It hurts everybody. So uh, I think we need to move forward. Well, here in the district, we're looking at an $800 million annual deficit at the moment, uh, which, is, which is a huge, a huge problem that we're facing here in the District of Columbia. That HEROES Act includes extending the $1,200 direct payments to individuals. Uh, it includes the, extending the unemployment insurance benefits, including that $600 uh, payout uh, through January, uh, heightens the test investment in testing. Um, hazard pay for essential workers, 200 billion. Uh, up until re just recently, it seemed like there was a bit of a political standoff in, in, in Congress around this. But yesterday, Senator McConnell uh, made a statement signaling that ready to ready to move something. Uh, the White House uh, in in the last couple of days has sent very similar signals. So you have the Heroes Act out there as the measure passed by the House. Um, tell us what lies ahead in your view and and the way forward for in trying to find a compromise set of of provisions here. Well, you're right. I think there's a growing recognition uh, that we need to uh, act once more uh, with a major uh, package of legislation. Um, Senator McConnell's had to walk back those earlier remarks uh, he made about allowing local jurisdictions uh, to go bankrupt. And the Trump administration recognizes uh, that additional help will be necessary to support the economy and to support workers. So where do we go from here? Well, Really, the, the ball is in Senator McConnell's court, uh, the administration's court. Uh, as we were talking, the House has, has acted. They put their proposal on the table. 
So they need to tell us um, what they like, or what they don't like. Um, and they've been very vague about it. They have been slow walking this uh, and they've not been engaged uh, in negotiations. Um, if you read the tea leaves and listen to the statements uh, you just mentioned, uh, it sounds like they may now be ready to engage. But Senator McConnell's been you know, talking about maybe the end of June. I think we should act earlier. Uh, he's put other parameters and, and conditions and demands uh, on the table, which he hasn't fully fleshed out. So look, we're in for a, 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 a big debate. Uh, I just hope as we debate, uh, we don't lose sight of the overall objective, which is to help people weather the storm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's turn to some of the public health measures. Um, we've entered a really uncertain and ambiguous and very anxious period right now as states have reopened, counties have reopened while urging, urging citizens to continue to adhere to social distancing and other things that will control infections and putting local capacities in place. There's a real fear that states and localities are, really, are not yet prepared to manage to do the testing and the contact tracing and isolation quarantining required to, 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 to respond to the outbreaks that will be inevitable. There's a fear that people are gonna to relax too quickly in their personal behavior and social distancing, wearing masks, hand washing, other things. Um, do you fear that we're in a, at a high risk of a rebound? of a rebound outbreak here in the, across the United States? Well, I try to listen to the healthcare experts, um, uh, not the political uh, folks. Uh, and we, of course, uh, from the very start, uh, seen very mixed messages uh, from this administration. On the one hand, we have uh, folks who are trying to give us uh, the facts, uh, people like Dr. Fauci. Uh, and of course, uh, then you have you know the president uh, undercutting some of those messages. But let's continue to focus on the messages the healthcare experts. And what they tell us uh, is that in order to reopen safely, um, we need to do it gradually and with testing. So it's not as if we're gonna go from an off light switch uh, to an on bright light. We're gonna go through the dimmer light uh, stages and that needs to be accompanied with ample testing so that we can quickly detect any kind of outbreak and isolate it and do the necessary contact tracing because we want to make sure that any outbreak remains a campfire and doesn't become a bonfire and a reignition of the pandemic. A reignition would of course undermine confidence both in the healthcare fight as well as uh, the economy. And so that's why it's important that we get this right. Um, and I do worry uh, because of the mixed messaging uh, that you could see a reignition of the virus and setbacks, which just underscores the importance of listening to the healthcare experts taking their guidance uh, and ramping up enough testing. And I must say, this has been the most frustrating area. Many of us have been pushing for weeks, in fact, months now, uh, the Trump administration to fully utilize the Defense Production Act, the DPA, to produce supplies of all the different testing equipment. Um, and uh, the reality is we're still seeing significant shortages. I think today we're doing about 400,000 tests per day. Right. The experts, there's a range, but you know, 5 million a day seems to be a a number of many people have converged around and we're not close to that. And the federal government has essentially offloaded a lot of this responsibility on the states, which in my view is irresponsible. Um, one of our audience members has raised the issue of the racial inequities that are running through the response and what we see in terms of the fatalities and extreme illness being very much disproportionately borne by people of color, people of poverty, we also have acutely vulnerable other populations. We know that those in nursing facilities, those that are frontline responders, those that are, are working in the service industries and in grocery stores and like. Say a little bit about what we're learning and what more we need to do with respect to racial inequities in these other acutely vulnerable populations. Well, that's, that's exactly right, uh, the, the question that came in. What we've seen is this pandemic has uh, exposed uh, deep disparities and inequities uh, in our healthcare systems and other systems uh, that we knew were there and, and need to be 
dealing with on an urgent basis. Many of us have been working on uh, closing those uh, gaps uh, in healthcare uh, disparities for a very long time. Uh, and we need to urgently uh, address those. Uh, we're seeing that very much in uh, my state of Maryland, uh, where communities of color, especially the African-American community, have been especially hard hit by COVID-19. Uh, I urged our governor to make sure that uh, we released the data, uh, the demographic data and the zip code data. I'm pleased that uh, he did that. And just recently, uh, our congressional delegation uh, wrote to our governor saying, okay, it's important to collect this information to better understand COVID-19, but we really need it to use to inform decisions and make sure resources, like testing resources, get to places they're needed most. Um, as you say, we're doing that with other hotspots like nursing homes, um, where uh, it's, again, taken way too long to ramp up testing, and we've seen awful losses. Uh, on Maryland's Eastern Shore, in our poultry plants, uh, we've seen some of the same issues that other meat processing uh, plants uh, have experienced around the country. And so we tried to surge resources there. But it's, it's just as important and equally important uh, that we surge resources to communities that have been hardest hit. And uh, that's true when it comes to the economic relief, uh, but it's also true when it comes to deploying testing and making sure that we stop uh, any outbreaks um, that, that, that may reignite uh, here. And so that has to be part of our strategy. That's what we uh, said to our governor, uh, and that needs to be true across the country. Yes, and it has been, it's been striking recently to watch how difficult, how much in Maryland folks are struggling. And, and they're not alone, but we've got the underserved populations in Prince George County, which is really the, the, uh, the biggest hotspot within the state of Maryland. We have, as you point out, the meat processing plants out in Accomack uh, County. We have enormous problems in the nursing home sector and tensions between the governor and county officials and a bifurcated approach. Can you say a little bit, why, why is it that Maryland's struggling in this fashion? Well, you know, er, early on, I think, you know, Maryland uh, was uh, a, a good model for the country in terms of that everybody was part of Team Maryland and everyone's messages um, were the same with respect to fighting this pandemic and the healthcare uh, challenges. Uh, but as we move toward uh, reopening uh, in our state, uh, we've had less of a, a uniform messaging. And in some ways, the governor has done what the president uh, did, which is to say local jurisdictions in Maryland, uh, you know, just do what you want without enough overall guidance. And it, it is true. Obviously, different regions um, need to adapt sort of policies to meet their specific needs. But we also know that the overall health care uh, requirements and protections, you know, th those are uniform. I mean, there's some guidelines that uh, everyone needs to follow no matter where uh, they live and work. And so I do believe that uh, in the last couple of weeks, we've seen uh, greater levels of confusion. And the testing issue um, remains a problem in Maryland as it does uh, throughout the country. Uh, we were talking about nursing homes. Um, it, we're, we, we're still having difficulty getting the full amount of testing that's necessary um, in nursing homes. And so that's just uh, one example. The, the lack of a national testing strategy uh, is going to be a serious problem and it can be fixed. And that's what's so frustrating. Well, it's true that there's no uniform standards or, or uni there's some guidance that's come out from CDC uh, and HHS. HHS guidance on testing came out this past weekend. CDC guidance on reopening has also come out, but we still don't have a clear national standard at all. We're seeing such a proliferation of different standards and different measures being taken across different communities. I mean, just looking at the way that the District of Columbia is making its calculations about reopening as against Virginia and Maryland, they started as a very unified uh, 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 leadership across those 
ranks, but as they got closer and closer to reopening, you could see them begin to diverge. And that was natural in the sense they were responding to these local pressures and the, and the considerations that came into play for each of them, the two governors and our mayor, but it also was a sign of just what was missing, uh, that we just don't have enough thinking and guidance at coming forward from a national level. Do you think we need to just continue to hammer on that, on that gap? I, I do. I think it's important, and, and you made the very important uh, observation that if you go back um, a number of weeks or months, uh, you had all those jurisdictions that sort of working in coordination, saying that they were going to move together uh, in a uniform way, recognizing that you know, this, is, this is a region. This is just one example, of course, uh, in the country. Uh, but now everybody has gone a little bit their own way. And I do believe that um, the lack of a consistent message um, is risks undermining uh, some of the progress uh, that we've made uh, through the social distancing today. Uh, you referenced the fact that uh, we now had HHS uh, you know, provide a, a, a testing blueprint, uh, they called it. Uh, that was only done because in the most recent bill that passed the Congress on a bipartisan basis, we directed them uh, to do it. Now, you may recall that the president said that testing was, quote, overrated, um, even though the experts tell us it's absolutely essential. And if you look at that uh, proposal, uh, some health healthcare experts um, have said it, it, it sounds like the Hunger Games, uh, where you know, again, it's everyone on their own. Uh, everybody go find their own supplies. They did. They did include some targets in terms of what they wanted to reduce, for example, in terms of swabs. But the track record so far uh, from the federal level in terms of producing the supplies has been terrible. Uh, so it's one thing to put it on paper. It's another thing to have a strategy to actually accomplish this. And so I, now we're again this testing, and this is going to be a repeated theme when we're talking about healthcare is so important because uh, that's the only way you can have confidence uh, that the pandemic is not reigniting and spreading uh, as we try to return to some sense of normalcy. Thank you. Um, it's probably not too early to begin thinking about how vaccines are going to be administered in, 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 in this country, including in Maryland. Um, we haven't focused too much on that because it's seen like a distant, uh, a critical milestone that will, will be transformative potentially if we arrive at a safe and effective um, vaccine. But there's also the launch of Operation Warp Speed. And when you listen to some of the key vaccine developers who are making claims and, 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 and along with Tony Fauci last night on national television saying, I, I, I'm beginning to feel more confident we may have a vaccine that can be administered by the end of the year. A remarkable timeline and a big change in thinking from what he was saying just a short while ago about a 12 to 18 month timeline. Um, so some of this may be wishful thinking, some of it may be true. Uh, we are in a different phase of life sciences and transformations in syn synthetic biology and the like. And we have some very promising candidates out there, but it's a very uncertain process. What's your thinking about what we should do in order to lay the groundwork now for uh, getting the population to have trust and confidence in the vaccine as it's coming forward? Fully a third of Americans in the surveys are saying they're really not very convinced they want to take this up. And if we're going to get to herd immunity, we're looking at 60 to 80% uptake. So that's, you know, it's a hazard. It's a hazard that will have delays and controversy surrounding vaccine, even if it's a safe and effective one now. We know there'll be misinformation campaigns and we know there are gonna be local capacity constraints and in the same inequities that we've been talking about are gonna be at play as the vaccine comes forward. Tell me, what do you think we should start doing now in this regard? Well, one of the very first stops I made after the outbreak of the coronavirus uh, was to visit uh, Tony Fauci's shop, Dr. Fauci's shop over at the National Institutes of Health, um, which is one of our national treasures. And you know, we're proud that it's uh, located in uh, the state of Maryland. 
Uh, and I talked to folks there and they had just begun. This was very early on. They had begun those clinical trials uh, with a few people and they were doing them out in Washington state. Uh, and at that time, uh, Dr. Fauci was saying it would take 12 to 18 months. And again, the timeline does remain uncertain. It is, it is good that we have so many uh, you know, scientists uh, working uh, to try to find a vaccine. And uh, you know, the very first bills passed by Congress were to rush more resources uh, to help with that purpose. Uh, and as you indicated, uh, there are going to be a number of challenges just on the issue of you know, misinformation. Uh, we should be fighting that really from the start right now, making it clear uh, that uh, you know, if and when there's a vaccine and it's gone through the trials, uh, that it's very important that people uh, take it because that's the only way to stop the transmission of the virus is if we have, as you said, a, a, a large share, a very large share of the population uh, getting uh, vaccinated, and you're going to have the anti-vaxxers uh, out there and the misinformation, which again underscores the importance of a strong national message. And you know, again, um, it, it's unfortunately not been the strong point from this present administration. You know, talking about some of the therapeutics um, that, that he's been recommending, when in fact the most recent studies show that they can be harmful. Um, so when it comes to the vaccine, we all need to be on the same page. Now, access uh, is going to be essential. I mean, a vaccine doesn't do any good uh, unless you have enough people taking it, as you indicated. And if you look at uh, the testing, uh, we worked, one of the very first things we did was to make sure testing for coronavirus uh, was universally available uh, to the extent that we can ramp it up, meaning that it shouldn't be prohibitive, prohibitively costly. It shouldn't, uh, everybody who needs to take it should be able to take it. We don't want people saying, I can't afford uh, to be tested. That hurts them and it hurts everybody else. Um, and so we did make those changes so that that's you know, uniformly available. The same needs to be true of a vaccine. I mean, we need to make sure that um, it's uh, available to everybody, that uh, you know, it's not unaffordable. Uh, this is a larger issue. We can talk about the larger issue of prescription uh, drug costs, and there are a number of proposals, including some I've advanced, uh, to deal with that. Uh, but uh, it is going to be absolutely essential that the rollout uh, be done in a, in a fair way um, and in a way where it's accessible to everybody. Um, you know, we can focus at first on populations that are most at risk, uh, but we need to do that in a fair and equitable way. Thank you. Um, two quick comments, and then I'd like to ask you a, a question on, uh, of an international sort. Uh, the two comments are, first of all, thank you for your leadership on the national service proposals that you've pushed forward with respect to AmeriCorps and Peace Corps with Senator Coons and others, and with respect to FEMA, the, the measure that you've advanced with Senator Markey. I think those are terribly important. And I, and I hope those do move forward and I hope we can be supportive of those measures. I think those are essential to get the kind of core force that we need, a national service at this moment in our history. The second point I wanna make is the mental health, the anxiety, depression dimension of this is something we're just beginning to understand better. Some of the studies, some of the surveys are showing fully a third of Americans suffering from excess stress and depression. And I do hope we can pay more attention to those as we, uh, the, that reality as we move forward. The international question is around the World Health Organization. Um, we know that the World Health Organization has come under assault from President Trump. Uh, he's suspended payments. He's threatening to withdraw membership. He's threatening to divert the 400, 450 million a year that we uh, uh, invest in that organization. And it's coming at a uh, a particularly acute and poignant moment when, when the pandemic is beginning to surge in low income and lower middle income countries with very large, unprotected, dense populations um, and the like. The Senate, it seems to me, is a place where cooler heads may be able to, uh, to prevail in arguing in favor of, wait a second, let's not, let's not blow a hole. WHO can be reformed, but let's not trash it at this critical moment. I just wanted to get your view. Is it possible on a bipartisan basis for folks in the Senate to sort of 
push back quietly or loudly, I, whatever it seems to make the most sense. Well, I certainly hope so, because it would be shooting ourselves in the foot uh, to try to incapacitate uh, or walk away from the WHO. But let me uh, first uh, thank you, Dr. Morrison and CSIS, uh, for all the work you've done uh, when it comes to national service programs, including AmeriCorps. Uh, I do think that can be a very important a part of our response in terms of testing, in terms of contact tracing, uh, and help you know put back to work uh, in a safe way um, Americans uh, who are out of work. So we are proposing, Senator Marky Coons and I and others uh, ramping that uh, up in a significant way. And then there are, of course, other huge national priorities, um, even when we're beyond the pandemic, uh, that AmeriCorps can be deployed uh, to address. Um, on the mental health front, I just want to second um, your concern about that. And again, the HEROES Act passed the House uh, has significant additional resources uh, for that purpose. Now, um, we all know that the World Health Organization um, is not a perfect organization. Um, they have lots of issues, uh, but uh, really they are the organization that does have a uh, worldwide scope. Uh, they are essential uh, as one of our early warning systems uh, when it comes to pandemics and uh, deploying resources to fight them. Uh, and we can obviously investigate um, you know, in due course, uh, how this uh, virus uh, began and the you know secrecy around it on the part of the government of China and what WHO did or did not do. But uh, to say that because an organization has flaws, you're going to walk away from it makes no sense. We should use our influence. We should use our leadership uh, to make the necessary reforms, but provide it with the resources they need. Uh, to do this job. And in addition to it being important on the healthcare uh, front, uh, it's also a huge mistake to allow government of China uh, to essentially usurp what has been traditionally American leadership uh, in WHO and other international organizations. Uh, that just plays into their hands. And finally, um, what a pandemic as teaches us, I mean, not, we shouldn't have to be learning this lesson, is that diseases like the coronavirus know no boundaries. And, you know, that's why it's so important to help use an international organization with international reach uh, to detect these viruses early and put them out uh, to help people overseas, but also to help everybody here at home uh, avoid the spread. Thank you. Um... We opened this conversation this morning with a kind of solemn moment of tribute to, and honor to those 100,000 American individuals who've died of COVID-19 in the last three months. Um, I'd like to close by asking you, what gives you the greatest hope and strength today as you look forward? What's giving you the greatest hope in our ability to prevail in this next period? Well, what gives me hope is when I see the, the response of, you know, the American people um, reaching out to help their neighbors in, in need. So, you know, if you have an elderly couple next door that was not able to go uh, to the grocery store, you know, people, you know, reaching out and offering to go with them. Uh, people, uh, including small businesses, uh, jumping in to make masks uh, for uh, people, um, you know, I went to a, a, a what, had, what had been used as a sort of hospital that had been converted uh, into a, a makeshift a mask uh, factory where people were, you know, who were out of work were using their time uh, to help make these uh, masks. Uh, and so I, I do believe that uh, that American spirit of helping others is alive and well, even in this era of political uh, polarization. And so that, that gives me hope that we will pull through this, this idea of neighbors helping neighbors. Um, but it's important that that message come from the political um, and elected leadership uh, as well. We need a message of unity. We need a message of helping one another and a message, as we were just talking about, of the fact that the world uh, does need to come together uh, to defeat this. I mean, this is a global challenge um, and we need to be reaching out to our allies and others around the world 
to fight this uh, together because we are all in it together. I know it's been said many times, but it is a fact. Well, Senator, uh, on behalf of everyone at CSIS, um, I wanna thank you so much for spending this time with us this morning. And I wanna thank you for your remarkable leadership on all of these matters that we've talked about today. I mean, you've left your fingerprints on almost every one of these topics that we've talked about. And uh, we're very grateful and we're in your debt for, for all that you're doing. So thank you so much. Well, thank you for bringing us together and thank you for your leadership uh, and CSIS's uh, leadership. And I wanna thank everybody uh, who tuned in today uh, to this new form of communication. I, I will say, uh, that uh, I have been in regular communication with lots of Maryland constituents. We've done three uh, large town halls where I brought on healthcare experts. Uh, so uh, it is an example of us adapting uh, to these uh, new circumstances. So thank you for, for doing this. Thank you. We'll be back.